purple yeah and uh, i think i'm just about to share the okay i'm going to make sure i share the right apologies for the delay uh there we go okay so um yep, yep. just and similar to screen, please. yep okay just similar yep. to Great. um I, I was very glad when i saw the uh running order for the pres presenters to realize that uh Professor Brown was going to go first because um, these are actually quite challenging, very broad questions. Um, so uh, I, I kind of felt like I just wanted to approach it partly from an Australian perspective, but also just reflecting uh, more generally on the region. So the first question is, can urban greens make cities physically cooler? If yes, then how? Um, now, there's been a lot of talk in the presentation so far um, around the urban heat island um and we undertook a study in 2017 where we were asked to actually look at the um the sort of mixture of the heat island and where trees were actually present in uh local governments in uh, across uh metropolitan australian cities and we began to challenge this idea of the urban heat island because um in fact australian cities typically do not actually exist on a sort of a flat um plain such as in the diagram before um uh, and crucially the rural or farming areas on the outskirts of cities can sometimes uh, in, in the summer will dry out and they'll actually be hotter than the uh center of the city or the su suburban areas um which happen to have more uh canopy cover and of course that's effect is rendered even more complex by the presence of water, uh, such as you can see here in the city of metropolitan Sydney, um, in the map on the left hand side. So what we did, um, discussing with colleagues, uh, uh, Peter Cachetta and Drew Devereaux at uh, CSIRO, this is the um, Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organization, is to try to reconceive um, the urban heat island as um, not about a difference of the surrounding rural areas, but um, a, a modeled temperature of the pre-farming land use. Um, so we used the CSIRO's data layers of forest cover, um, uh, elevation and aspect to derive candidate fit points around the city that could provide a comparator for how um, hot the city was so as to identify those urban heat island uh, effect in a way that was um, we felt was better tailored to local circumstances. So here in Sydney, um, you can see the way that the heat is distributed differently, uh, mainly to the west of the city um, in and uh, completely differently from there's almost a very sharp north uh, east uh, southwest split in the city as well as a sort of east-west uh, split more generally. Um, but when we think about the urban heat island as well, this data set provided us with some really interesting insights um, into how this was distributed in other ways. So simply by clustering um, a single uh, extreme heat um, layer or number, we could actually identify by different colors how that individual heat island is clustered. So you can see here right in the middle, there is a huge heat island right in the center of the city that pretty much covers most of Western Sydney. And there's a smaller um, heat island down to the south and so on. And I think one of the questions to ask and following on from Professor Yokohari's uh, keynote presentation around um, green corridors or breezeways, is you know one of the critical things to do to think about is to how to break up that um, massive heat island or even a heat continent that is uh, present in the center of the city because those are going to be the places where you get the biggest amount of residual heat building up um, over a 24-hour period here you can see a map of how we uh, map that heat island with um, uh, areas of uh, social economic disadvantage of course, the typical trends are that um, industrial land uses, uh, big infrastructure produces a lot of heat. Um, those tend to be places where uh, cheaper housing is located. So there's definitely a link between the two, but also in the 
in the longer settled areas, you actually tend to get bigger trees. And so you tend to get more shading, which is why these places tend to be cooler. Um, just in the two years since we published that study, uh, the area has become a lot more complex and interesting. And so colleagues of ours in uh, Western Australia did this nice study that looked at all the different ways on the left hand side um, that trees and greening and heat uh, could be linked into a sort of almost um, using a statistical technique called random forest to try to cluster these different relationships um, in different ways. So I recommend you have a look at the paper um, if you get the chance. Second question, um, and I'll cover this more briefly, um, Makoto, if that's okay, is how can urban greens contribute to make people feel cooler? Um, in Melbourne, there's a famous study or a famous case of the city of Melbourne that um, wanted to, uh, that produced a map of every single tree um, online for people. Um, and the idea was that people were going to use this map to sort of say that there was a problem with the tree, maybe the branch was getting in the way or something or something like that. But it turned out that people were actually keen to write to the individual trees and uh, the city ended up having to nominate somebody who would respond on behalf of the tree. So you can see here, uh, someone's actually written to the tree uh, um, 102794 and saying, how's it, how's it going, etc. cetera. Um, and I think that there's some definite possibilities there when we think about how to make people feel cooler. Of course, there's the root finding app. There's the uh, thermal digital twin, as someone has put in the Q&A, but I think there's some, um, a review work to be done to try to figure out new directions uh, in making people feel cool through uh, digital information. Um, just on the, uh, you'll be interested to know, um, Makoto, about the, the trend of forest bathing or Shinrin Yoku, which has even taken over the Royal Botanical Gardens in Melbourne, where they uh, run classes. And I think that this is part of um, this trend of effect effect through embodied practice practices of cooling cooling is not just as you're implying a physical thing but also a psychological one um, and i think we should really be very aware of the kind of um, the contrast uh, in land uses between what was anticipated by early pioneers um, in the australian landscape where they recognized the importance of water and of cooling spaces, uh, such as for the competition for Canberra in 1901 on the left-hand side. And in fact, what the reality is of um, shopping centers and big urban car parking spaces and suburbanization on the American model and how much um, uh, ground there is to make up in terms of cooling. Just a, a final um, note, I guess, is thinking about it more generally. Um, I think on the basis of the the sort of pattern language, I guess, that we have in Australia for understanding greening. I think there's um, a lot to be learned um, in the regions. Um, and going back, in fact, to what you were saying in your talk about um, Japan and the, the, the ways in which shading and green spaces are used. Um, here are some photographs from uh, Yangon that I took in 2017 that are very much along the similar lines where shading and um, trees are similarly venerated. Okay, that's it from me, thank you. Thank you very much, Mariko. Well, I didn't know that the Shinyoku is already in Australia. Um, I thought that Wagyu is the only Japanese term you're using in Australia, but now Shinyoku too. <laughs> yes. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's it's interesting because you know the the botanical gardens in there are many botanical gardens actually in Australia, um, and it's uh, interesting how they're being kind of reinvented um, for different purposes. So, yeah, that's one one of the one of the one of the activities taking place there. <laughs>